I'm talking today with Nick Souza, who is a senior lecturer in law in the QUT Faculty of Law. And Nick's going to be talking about his views on open access. So Nick, what do you think are the shortcomings of traditional subscription-based publishing for academic works? Thanks, Paula. It's a really interesting question. Uh, we're in a, a, a very interesting point in time now for scholarly communications, uh, where we're increasingly seeing the negative effects of what has essentially become a capture of the academic publishing uh, industry by commercial publishers. And this is some fairly serious implications for academic scholarship in the way in which we disseminate the results of publicly funded research. So particularly we've seen um, a lot of problems for libraries, the increasing costs of subscription access. Uh, I think the uh, statistics show uh, over a 300% rise in the costs of journal subscriptions for libraries over the last 30 years. For uh, academics in the humanities and social sciences, like me, it's even more pronounced to see the drop in circulation of uh, academic monographs and the diminishing opportunities for academics to get published. The average circulation for an academic monograph these days is around 300 copies. Uh, that brings the, the cost of accessing the fruits of academic knowledge to um, makes it really inaccessible to a large sector of the community. So for me, it's really a question about why we engage in this academic endeavour and how we want to see the fruits of that labour disseminated to the public. And if we believe that one of our core goals as academics is to see knowledge, new knowledge created and disseminated as widely as possible, then it becomes important to ensure that the results of scholarly research are made available in an open access form, in a way that is available not just to people in well-funded research libraries, but also to people around the world. And uh, we're seeing a lot of problems for people who are outside of the traditional higher education system or outside or in higher education outside of well-funded research libraries not being able to access the information that they need to be able to um, make a contribution to scholarly literature and I think that's a, a real concern that we as academics need to take charge of what we've seen is that the interests of commercial publishers have gotten in the way and made us to in some extent lose sight of that core goal of academia as contributing to human knowledge and we need to make sure that the structures that we set up that the valuable roles that publishers play don't get in the way of that core goal to disseminate knowledge. What challenges do you see for early career researchers publishing in open access outlets? So it's a real problem for early career researchers because often we see that early career researchers are very committed to the importance of publishing their knowledge, publishing their uh, research as widely as possible. And this is important, one, for um, a personal sense, for reputational uh, purposes. We want to get our knowledge and want to get our um, research outputs out there, read and maybe even cited once in a while. Um, but there's also a competing tension because the established publishers that tend to be closed access also have a, a type of monopoly on esteem measures. The, the reputation of the more older established journals and, uh, and other outlets means that it's very difficult to publish uh, in an open access publication if you're an early career researcher trying to make your name in the world. So it becomes very tough to negotiate those two competing tensions and uh, we're unfortunately not seeing as much change in that as, uh, as one would hope to enable people to have a real choice in the types of outlets that are available. Mm. What about the opportunities? Uh, do you think open access can help early career researchers? So it's an excellent question that we don't really have solid data on at this point. Um, I think intuitively there are solid advantages to publishing in open access journals and certainly um, from my own limited experience and some anecdotal evidence that we have, it seems as though 
if your material is more readily available, it's more likely to be read and cited and used. Now, we don't have solid stats and we're working pretty hard. People are working pretty hard around the world with um, projects like Altmetrics to try to understand how open access materials actually do get disseminated. But to me, the, the core advantage really is a personal one that I want my material, my research works to be available to the public. I want to be able to very easily share the um, the articles that I write with the people that I meet and uh, perhaps even um, make them publicly available so that I can meet new people, new collaborators in the field from around the world. And you see that, I think um, ePrints is a good example, you see that you get quite a lot of traffic from people who are just browsing around for materials that they are finding through non-traditional research sources. So search engines like Google Scholar have become much more important in the way in which we find information. And that indexes publicly accessible materials. So when you have your a version of your scholarship available in an open access form, that can certainly help discoverability, which is one of the big problems. Um, it's great to do the research, but what we really want to see is to see that research used. And to me, when we're talking about the benefits from open access, the personal benefits, then certainly that, in, that enhanced uh, discoverability and accessibility is really important. What about research data? Should that be open access too? So research data is actually a really interesting question. We haven't fully got to grips with all of the ramifications of research data and how we can make it available, whether we should make it available and what implications that has for ethics particularly. But there is a growing movement around the world to make data more open in order to enable pre predominantly um, validation of research results. That it's becoming apparent that it's not enough now just to publish the output, but you also need to be able to publish the data set upon which that output was based in order to allow researchers from around the world to actually verify the methods and the conclusions that you've drawn upon to, um, in research. So that's really interesting from one perspective. There's also a really interesting shift in terms of efficiency and in terms of new opportunities that we have in this big data environment that we can get by combining existing data sets. So there's a really strong argument, just as when the fruits of my or the fruits of academic labor, when it's publicly funded research paid for by the taxpayer, should be made available freely and openly back to the taxpayer payer for future um, innovation use of that research. There's a similar argument to be made about data collection, that where possible, if the data is being collected with public funds, we're creating really valuable data sets that potentially should also be made available to the public, to other researchers, to be able to use to generate new outputs. And we're seeing some really interesting projects where people are able to mash up different data sets, where people are able to reanalyze existing data sets with new research questions, interrogate them in new and interesting ways, and you get real efficiencies for, um, for research activities like that if you have those data sets available. And you also enable things that were not previously possible. So new types of questions that you couldn't do in, um, in a traditional research environment, you're able to do with more open data sets. The problem is that there are real ethical implications about sharing data. And we haven't quite worked, out, worked through all of those yet. Um, we do have a culture where we require informed consent of participants about what data is being collected and how their data will be used in the future. And you can't necessarily guarantee in an open data environment that their research, that their data will be used in the way that is within the contemplated field of possibilities at the time at which the data was collected. So it becomes tough, and particularly when you're dealing with sensitive populations, for example, um, there is a real risk that the data will be used in a way that could be harmful to the data subject, the person who originally disclosed it. So we need to work through this because there are very important reasons. One, for, um, for the importance of being able to validate the science. Two, for efficiency and the ability to create new unexpected research outcomes. Um, there is a very strong argument that we should have a move towards a greater um, access of research data, but it is still in the works and we haven't quite got there yet. 
Open access advocacy has been happening for over 10 years now. What, if anything, do you think is holding it back? We've seen great advances in open access advocacy and the uptake of open access by institutions. Institutions like QUT have been great in leading the way in how we can increase the deposits of scholarly information and the accessibility of scholarly uh, outputs. What's holding it back is an interesting and complex question. The In the abstract, open access is a great idea and it seems easier to sell. That You have publicly funded research, it should be publicly available. That's a very basic point that we have seen get a lot of traction. The problem is there's quite a lot of money bound up in the system. There is a... that commercial publishers are in a position, quite a position of power, and they fear being disrupted by open access publishing. So we've seen quite a bit of lobbying, and I don't want to malign publishers too much, that there are a lot of functions that publishers do that are very socially beneficial, that do add value to academic publishing. But also there's a sense that some publishers rely on academic labour to produce the materials, academic labour to edit and review the materials. And the amount of value that the publishers are putting in is disproportionate compared to the amount of value they're extracting from the public sector. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of negotiation at the moment, and you see this particularly clearly in the UK, for example, where there was a push to make all publicly funded materials available under an open access license. And there's a um, lot of lobbying about what exactly that means and what the role of publishers is going to be in this brave new world. And obviously there's a strong incentive for publishers to prefer a particular model of open access, the, the gold open access model, where the institution or the research funder will actually pay their costs of production so that they're able to make their materials open access without any real disruption in their business model. Now, there is an argument on the other side that perhaps their business model does need to be disrupted to an extent because there are inefficiencies in the business model. But then we have to worry about ensuring that there are incentives for people to actually publish the incentives for the, the publishers to do the publishing jobs uh, in actually editing and uh, um, making available academic knowledge. So there's a, there's a political struggle going on, which is one of the reasons that the push towards open access has not been as fast as we might otherwise have liked. What are you most optimistic about for the future of open access? I'm actually really optimistic about the future of open access. As I said, it's a pretty easy sell that the results of publicly funded information should be publicly accessible. And we're seeing that picked up a lot by the funding agencies in particular. So the ARC and the NHMRC in Australia have put this in their mandates to require uh, open access publication of publicly funded research. We're seeing private funders do the same thing, that um, the philanthropic organisations who fund a lot of work want to see the greatest bang for buck. So for them, there's a very clear argument that the research they fund should also be available in an open access way. So from a top-down way, I'm really optimistic about how the um, the culture and the policies are changing amongst the funders of research. From a bottom-up way, I'm actually really interested too in the ways in which publishers and uh, other people interested in scholarly communication are innovating in how we can actually fund open access publishing in a way that's sustainable and reaps the benefit of wide dissemination. So I'm really, really interested in models like Knowledge Unlatched, which provide a way for publishers to um, cooperate with libraries and other funders of research to publish open access books. So Knowledge Unlatched deals with uh, open access monographs and monographs are quite expensive and a lot of the editorial work that is done in publishing a monograph is actually done in-house by the publisher. So they they provide a valuable service to the academic uh, community. Now that service is currently paid for, paid for by libraries who pay quite a lot of money for um, relatively small circulation print runs of, of books in closed access format. What's really interesting is that some people are starting to innovate to say that if the libraries are paying for it anyway, perhaps the libraries could pay up front 
and make the monograph available open access from the start. We're seeing the same thing happen in the science space. Um, particularly CERN has been able to, or has tried through the Scope 3 project, to flip the academic publishing model in high energy physics. So they've gone out to tender and they've asked the major uh, publishers of journals in physics to see whether they would be willing to en engage in a similar bargain. That they are they tender for the amount that they would require to publish their journals each year and the academic community around the world thousand different libraries from around the world come together and see whether they can raise that amount of money and instead of buying closed access journal subscriptions they fund the input costs of publication and enable that to be released to the world at large now that requires a lot of negotiation and it's really interesting but i am really hopeful that there's a lot of goodwill actually amongst academics amongst libraries research funders and publishers to find ways to make it work well so i am really one interested from a research perspective because it's my area of research but two also i'm actually quite optimistic about how cooperation can work to make uh, academic publication uh, more efficient and more effective Thank you, Nick, for sharing your ideas with us today.